Uh, we're very pleased to welcome Jen Frey, who's the Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of South Carolina and a Fellow of the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America. She was previously a Collegiate Assistant Professor of Humanities at the University of Chicago, where she also served as the Assistant Director of the Lumen Christi Institute. Uh, she's published widely on action, virtue, practical reason, and metaethics, and she's recently co-edited an interdisciplinary volume, Self-Transcendence and Virtue, Perspectives from Philosophy, Theology, and Psychology. You have seen her writing everywhere that's important, and you may have also heard her podcast, Sacred and Profane Love, which is doing record numbers on the, the podcast uh, places as we speak. Uh, so if you could, please help me welcome Professor Jennifer Frey on Walker Percy on the pursuit of happiness in apocalyptic times. Thank you so much, Austin. Uh, and thanks to everybody at Lumen Christi for inviting me uh, to come back to Chicago. Um, I'm glad to be here, but I'm also a little bit sad because the last Lumen Christi talk I gave Thomas Levergood and uh, Father Paul Mankowski were in the audience, and I really deeply feel their absence here tonight. And uh, this talk uh, is really just dedicated to their loving memory. Okay, so what Walker Percy can teach us about happiness in apocalyptic times. Two days ago, I read an interview in the New York Times with superstar professor of cognitive science, Dr. Lori Santos of Yale University, who was once again being consulted as an expert in the science of happiness. Dr. Santos's academic fame rests on a course that she taught in 2018 titled Psychology and the Good Life, which made headlines all over the world because over one quarter of Yale's undergraduate population enrolled in her class, making it the most sought after in the institution's history. Santos, with the full support of Yale, quickly pivoted from this to sharing the good news about happiness with the rest of us. So through her online coursework and a very popular podcast, it's been downloaded about 64 million times which is many more times than my podcast. <laughs> uh, so that we can all live happier lives through the scientific techniques that she so generously shares with us. In her most recent interview in the, Times, in the New York Times Magazine, Dr. Santos informs us that religious people are happier, but not because of their knowledge. That is to say, not really because of their faith, but because of the actions they perform as religious people. So they do things like go to church and go to social events, uh, you know, as part of the church. They volunteer, they meditate, which I think is her word for praying. And one reason to think that religious people are better at doing these kinds of things, performing these kinds of actions, is that they have the cultural apparatus that encourages them and supports them in the doings of these kinds of actions that she thinks in general will make you a happier person. Now when asked a follow-up question about whether someone might get the same kinds of positive psychological affect from joining their local white supremacist group, she couldn't rule it out. For on her view, happiness is really just about how you feel. You might just as easily get a happy feeling at a Nazi rally as at a mass, as far, at least, as the science of happiness can tell you. When asked at the end of the interview what the purpose of life is, Santos dispensed the following wisdom. It's smelling your coffee in the morning. It's loving your kids. It's having sex and daisies and springtime. It's all the good things in life. That's what it is. Now, I have debated Lori Santos at Yale about her views on happiness, and I have written about those debates, and it will surely not surprise you that I take a dim view of her particular gospel of self-help. And yet, her view carries with it the authority of science, and so it demands our intellectual submission. And I am only a lowly philosopher, and most people are surprised to know that philosophers still exist, let alone consult them on matters of great importance. 
like happiness. Even worse, I am a Catholic, someone who believes in a Holy Ghost and a miraculous host and virgin births and all of that. And also, I do not have tenure at Yale. <laughs> but let us set aside the philosophers for now and ask ourselves how the artist might respond to the idea that happiness is all about how you feel and that you can be happy if you are just equipped with the correct scientifically proven techniques and that happiness really isn't so hard anyway because it's just daisies and sunshine and sex. And in particular, I want to invite us to turn to the novelist. And I think we can do, we can do no better to respond to the evangelistic efforts of Yale University than to turn to Walker Percy. In part, this is because Percy was first a scientist, right? He was a physician before he decided to study philosophy and then decided to write novels. In fact, I can think of no better novelist than Percy for our particular cultural and political moment in the United States. So in this talk, I want to briefly introduce Percy and his fiction, in case you're not familiar with it. And then I want to zero in on two novels in particular that I think we could all benefit from reading. There's The Moviegoer, which won the National Book Award, and then there is my favorite Percy novel, which is Love in the Ruins, The Adventures of a Bad Catholic at a Time Near the End of the World. Okay, so first, a little bit about Walker Percy. So Walker Percy was a 20th century Southern Catholic writer who lived just outside of New Orleans, Louisiana. Percy was born in May 1916 in Birmingham, Alabama. His father was an Episcopalian educated at Princeton and Harvard who practiced law in Birmingham. And his mother, Maddie Sue, came from one of the wealthiest Presbyterian families in Georgia. Their marriage was publicly announced as uniting two of the most prominent old families of the South. But despite their social prominence and wealth, all was not well in the Percy family. While Walker was still an infant, his grandfather and namesake, who had long suffered from bouts of severe depression, shot himself in the face. While officially ruled an accident, the family accepted the event as an obvious suicide. And although he was a dedicated father, Leroy Pratt Percy also suffered from severe depressive and anxious episodes and would also kill himself 12 years after his own father's suicide while Walker was away at summer camp and he was just 13 years old. After his father's death, Walker went to live with his father's first cousin, William Alexander Percy, in Greenville, a small city located on the Mississippi Delta. A poet, a decorated war hero, and the son of a US senator, Uncle Will, as he was called, was a larger-than-life figure for young Percy. Will introduced him to great literature, to poetry, to music, and to philosophy, all of which sparked an interest in writing that would never leave him. It was also in Greenville that Walker Percy first met his lifelong friend and literary confidant, the writer and Civil War historian, Shelby Foote. Foote is now widely recognized after his rather remarkable appearance as part of the Ken's Burns documentary on the Civil War. So if you know Shelby Foote, it's probably from that. And uh, Love in the Ruins is dedicated to Shelby Foote. It was from his uncle Will that Percy was first introduced to Catholicism. Percy's upbringing up to that point was properly Protestant, but personally a religious. Although he went to Presbyterian church, he was said to have known from the start that neither Protestant denomination he grew up with had any answers for him. In an interview, Percy remarked that he was at a loss to say whether Presbyterianism had any meaningful impact on his life. He stopped going to church as soon as the pressure to go had abated. Uncle Will's mother was a French Catholic. Although he did not practice his mother's faith, his mother's faith, Will had an enormous respect for Catholicism. Of his Uncle Will's views on Catholicism, Percy wrote the following. 
Will used to speak often in admiration of the Catholic Church, of her wisdom, her noble traditions, her aesthetic beauty, etc. But he would not have regarded himself as a believer. That is to say, he did not believe that God actually revealed himself in time through the Jewish people, through the incarnation, through the Catholic Church. Right? He just sort of saw the church as a repository for wisdom and as Christ as kind of a, a philosophical sage, sort of like Socrates or the Buddha. Now, his uncle took permanent custody of Walker when, just two years after his father's suicide, his mother died in a mysterious drowning. Although her death was ruled a tragic car accident, Walker was convinced, and not without evidence, that his mother also took her own life. Like many who are impacted by the suicide or attempted suicide of loved ones, these events would haunt Walker for the rest of his life. It is little surprise that the question and presence of suicide pervades most of his fiction. Indeed, Percy often talked of himself, qua novelist, as an ex-suicide. So one thing to think about when you are reading Walker Percy is what that could possibly mean. Like Camus, when asked once about the influence of fellow Southern novelist William Falker, Faulkner on his writing, Percy remarked the following. I like to think of beginning where Faulkner left off with a Quentin Compson who didn't commit suicide. Suicide is easy. Keeping Quentin Compson alive is what I'm interested in doing as a novelist. So the question that interested Percy then is how to live in the everyday post-Christian age in which the old ideas and the old values and the old self-understanding have collapsed. And that was the age that he thought he lived in and surely that he would think we live in. Although Percy would write poetry throughout high school, after he graduated, he went to the University of North Carolina with the intention to pursue further study in the sciences. His college years were unremarkable. He did well, he joined a fraternity, and eventually he decided to pursue a higher degree in medicine at Columbia University in New York City. And after Columbia, he began his medical practice back in Greenville, Mississippi, where he met and began dating his future wife, Mary Bernice Townsend, also known as Bunt. But he did not stay in Greenville. Percy left for a prestigious internship at a hospital in Manhattan. But only half a year later, in 1943, he would contract tuberculosis and promptly resign from his position. In his long period of recovery at a sanatorium in upstate New York, Percy began to, began to contemplate both his mortality and his humanity. His philosophical questions, the questions that he was asking himself, were squarely in the realm of philosophical anthropology. So the question of man, what is man? What is his place in the cosmos? Of this period in his life, Percy wrote the following. I was in bed so much, alone so much, that I had absolutely nothing to do but read and think. I began to question everything that I had once believed. I began to ask why Europe, why the world, had come to such a sorry state. I never turned my back on science. It would be a mistake to do that to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I had wanted to find answers through an application of the scientific method. I had found that method a rather impressive and beautiful thing. The logic and precision of systematic inquiry, the mind's impressive ability to be clear-headed, to reason. But I gradually began to realize that as a scientist, as a doctor, as a pathologist, I knew so very much about man, but I had very little idea what man is. So the questions and concerns provoked by his prolong prolonged illness and his brush with death were existential, right? They were questions of self-knowledge. What sort of thing am I? Science, including medical science and psychiatry, had equipped Percy with theories to study things as objects. 
and it had taught him to study the human body and the human mind as just another object in the world. But the human self is not just another object in the world to be understood according to scientific method. It cannot, in fact, be broken down into simpler elements and principles in the same way. So the method he had mastered couldn't be applied to the thing that he now wanted to understand, which was himself. So Percy's illness and convalescence opened up the space for philosophical contemplation. And once he entered into this space in a serious way, he realized that despite his 12 years of dedicated study, he didn't have a clue who he was or what he was doing. In his illness, he would say, he came to himself for the first time. And the result was that he sort of suffered his first catastrophe of the self, a catastrophe that he would later on in life diagnose as the catastrophe that is the inevitable lack of self-knowledge. For without understanding what he is, and therefore who he is, he could have no answers, no way to find meaning in his own existence, and definitely no way to find meaning in his death, which is inevitable. It was at this period that he turned to the existentialist philosophers, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, Marcel, Sartre, and Albert Camus. Walker's convalescence was long, and he was constantly seeking out climates for his compromised lung functioning. His ill health led both Walker and Shelby to Santa Fe, New Mexico. This is the summer of 1945. It was at this time that Percy made up his mind about how he was going to live out the rest of his life. He would get married. He would practice religion. He would go back to work, probably as a writer. With seemingly no hesitation, he telegrammed the following to his girlfriend. I need you to be my wife. I am neurotic as hell. I need you to get me out of my state. I love you. <laughs> he then flew to New Orleans and proposed marriage. She accepted, and soon after they were married at a Baptist church on St. Charles Avenue. As they began their life together, Percy did begin writing full-time, and both of them began to be instructed in the Catholic faith. In an interview, Percy explains his turn to religion. I took it as an absolutely intolerable state of affairs to have found myself in this life and in this age, which is a disaster by any calculation, without demanding a gift commensurate with the offense. So I demanded it. This raises the question every convert faces. OK, but why Catholicism? Percy's answer is, I think, the only really acceptable one. The reason I am Catholic is because I believe what the Catholic Church proposes is true. So he became a Catholic on December 13, 1947, and at the same time dedicated himself to the task of writing full time. So Percy's answer to the question, why are you a Catholic, is the best way into understanding what he is doing as an artist, as a novelist, and arguably, I think, as a philosopher as well. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about it, but he also wrote many philosophical essays. Um, and the reason that I say this is that Percy, I think, is rightly understood and understood himself as a Southern Catholic novelist which he considered somewhat proudly a double disability. First, there is the problem of what he called prostituted vocabulary. In the South, words like grace and sin and redemption are common, but they have become devalued and overused and shopworn. They are like so much background noise. So decrepit and abused is the language of the Judeo-Christian religions that it takes a concerted effort to salvage them, the very words from the husk and barnacles of meaning which have encrusted them over the centuries. And so the novelist must use every ounce of skill, cunning, humor, even irony to deliver religion from the merely edifying. The word happiness, right, alongside grace and sin and redemption. It was clear that Percy thought this was a word 
that had become shopworn and devalued and also needed to be recovered. And that it was the task of the fiction writer to try to show to people its true meaning again, right? And it's interesting to me that Percy, who again also wrote a lot of philosophy, um, thought that it was the novelist who had this special task of uh, recover, recovering the true meaning of words. Now the second problem that the Southern Catholic novelist has is dealing with the inattentiveness of the age. We are busy, we are distracted, we are overcome by malaise and ennui, we are unable to contemplate. And of course he's writing this like in the 50s and the 60s. This is well before the digital age of smartphones. So how does the novelist grab the attention of his reader? How does the novelist force his reader to recognize his own catastrophe? I don't think Percy had a single strategy for this, but as a Catholic, he knew that it had to come by way of indirection because art is not apologetics. He once described his novels as almost certain to offend most Catholics. He seemed fine with that since the novelist simply holds up a mirror to his reader. The Catholic writer, he argued, must attack, must probe, must challenge, must make uncomfortable. The only question for Percy is whether or not the novelist reveals something true. And the truth about ourselves and the truth about our culture, even Catholic culture, hardly ever flatters us or comforts us. Comfort and consolation is not a demand that we can make of the artist, but especially not of the novelist. So Percy died in 1990, just shy, just a few days shy of his 75th birthday. He had published six novels, 42 essays, and a philosophically rich parody of the self-help genre called Lost in the Cosmos. Uh, which I actually, I'm, I'm not going to talk about Lost in the Cosmos, but um, it's totally brilliant and hilarious, and you should definitely read it. Okay, so that's Walker Percy, the person. Um, there's a lot more that you could say about Percy, um, but that's just enough, I think, to get us to our actually actual topic this evening, which is Walker Percy on happiness. Um, and to get into the topic of happiness, I just want to start with his first novel, which is The Moviegoer. Um, this, this was his debut novel, and it won the National Book Award. It was incredibly popular, which is um, kind of marvelous to think about um, because it's, it's such a Catholic novel. <laughs> um, but it's a novel about a pilgrim at the midpoint of his life who is on a search for some kind of meaning or transcendence, or truth. So the novel's protagonist, Binks Bowling, is like Percy, born of good Southern stock, but he finds himself detached, alienated, and dislocated from the Southern ideals and traditions he was by birth shouldered with the task of carrying forward. Rather than live in the French Quarter or the Garden District, Binks chooses to live and work in the middle-class suburb of Gentilly, outside of New Orleans, a place that is totally evacuated of tradition, meaning, or anything resembling real community. It is a place designed to maximize the prospects for the individual pursuit of pleasure and material consumption. And Binks enjoys Gentilly. It's really where he wants to be. He is a war veteran who trades stocks, and he spends the bulk of his time watching movies. He has a particular penchant for bad movies. Of his own life, he, testif he testifies, I spend my entire time working, making money, going to movies, and seeking the company of women. One morning, inexplicably, the idea of a search comes to him, and suddenly he sees things in his life as they are for the first time. He comes to himself in Percy's way of speaking for the first time. And that's when he wants to go on this search. And the search, we are told, is what anyone would undertake if he were not sunk in the everydayness of his ordinary life. But the protagonist, Binks, is stuck in what Percy calls the malaise. 
This is a kind of suffering anxiety or sense of unease. It is the sinking recognition that in spite of all this pleasure, and in spite of the fact that all of his material needs and desires are being met, something is not quite right. He enjoys all the advantages of wealth, status, and education, but he feels constantly disappointed, right? He's like St. Augustine in the middle of the Confessions when he basically meets a homeless beggar and realizes, wait, you're better off than me. Where have I gone wrong? So the malaise is this sinking feeling. It's tinged with despair. Binks tries to distract himself with it. The movies and the women in his life help. But not even sex, that last and only bright hope, can help him transcend the malaise. Because sex, when neither hallowed and redeemed through the sacrament, or on the other hand, despised as sin, is really just the flesh. And as Binks comes to discover, flesh, poor flesh, fails us. Of sex in the post-Christian landscape, Binks relates the following. Christians talk about the horror of sin, but honestly, they have overlooked something. They keep talking as if everyone were a great sinner, but the truth is that nowadays, one is hardly up to it. There is very little sin in the malaise. In fact, the highest moment of the Malaysian's life can be that moment when he manages to sin like a proper human being. <laughs> so the malaise, if you're, if you're familiar with Kierkegaard, then you sort of recognize that the malaise is a little bit like Kierkegaard's sickness unto death, right? This kind of despair. But the malaise is Percy's characterization of our post-Christian, post-modern condition, whose general circumstances are so aptly captured by the affluent suburb of Gentilly. And not even his southern roots can help cure him. After a conflict that is the climax of the novel, his aunt, who represents the old southern aristocratic vision of the world, a kind of stoic, gentlemanly ideal, asks him poignantly what the purpose of his life is, what his own preferred vision of how to live is, because she's confused, right? But Binks is only able to render a blank stare in response. He realizes he has no answer. His search has turned up absolutely nothing. And his inability to answer his aunt's demand launches him ever more deeply into despair. And he confesses. Now in the 31st year of my dark pilgrimage on this earth and knowing less than I ever knew before, having learned only to recognize merda when I see it, having inherited no more from my father than a good nose for merda, for every species of shit that flies, my only talent, smelling merda from every quarter, living in fact in the very century of merda, the great shit house of scientific humanism, where needs are satisfied, everyone becomes an anyone, a warm and creative person, and prospers like a dung beetle, and 100% of people are humanists, and 98% believe in God, and men are dead, dead, dead. And the malaise has settled like a fallout, and what people really fear is not that the bomb will fall, but that the bomb will not fall. On this, my 30th birthday, I know nothing, and there is nothing to do but fall prey to desire. So he is really stuck uh, in a kind of deep despair, a kind of very deep existential despair. And he is ready to give up his search, to accept total despair and to reconcile himself to navigating the all-pervasive malaise. But interestingly, Percy's novel does not end in despair. It is a comedy, and it ends in marriage, which redeems Binks and his previously suicidal bride. In the end, Binks the pilgrim sees a sign. He sees ashes on a forehead whose potential meaning is that sin is real, and reconciliation is both necessary and possible for him. And this sign points him in the proper direction to a meaning that, in transcending this material life altogether, 
offers the only cure to the malaise that ails him. Now the moviegoer works as a novel because Percy is able to avoid the twin pitfalls of being a Southern Catholic novelist. He does not give himself over to the idea that the Southern sense of time, place, history, and tragedy is anything more than a misplaced nostalgia. Nor does he give himself over to the shopworn language of Christianity, as if the words can still have their value for us. He recognizes that they do not. The novel shows Percy's vision of his role as a fiction writer. The role first to diagnose the sickness of our culture and to give it a name. Of the task of literature generally, Percy writes, the primary business of literature is cognitive. It's a kind of finding out and knowing and telling. It's a celebration of the way things are when they are right and a diagnostic enterprise when they are wrong. Obviously, for Percy, <laughs> they are mostly a diagnostic enterprise. And Percy's novel works because it correctly diagnoses a disease we all more or less suffer from without realizing it and without having a name for it, and it points the way to a possible cure for what ails us. And so his novel ends on a hopeful note that man's search for meaning and an authentic existence may not, in fact, end in total absurdity. He does not think with Camus that it is all so pointless and that we must bravely face down the pointlessness of our lives. Indeed, he does not think we can imagine Sisyphus happy. As a Catholic writer, Percy wants us to see that if the search is successful, if it can be successful, it ends with a recognition of one's proper place in this life, in the cosmos. It ends in a renewed kind of self-knowledge, a new understanding of who one is and what one's purpose is. Man is a homo viator, a pilgrim or a wayfarer seeking salvation. Man's happiness is not here. His life is finite, but there is in him something that reaches out towards and can only be fulfilled by the infinite. This proper knowledge is self-knowledge, and without this self-knowledge, man will find himself lost, abstracted, detached, alienated, searching and longing, but not knowing for what. So that's the moviegoer, and um, it's interesting to discuss the moviegoer in Love and the Ruins uh, at one and the same time because they are so very different. How many people have actually read the movie Goer in Love and the Ruins? Okay, I see like a few hands. Um, yes, um, so, so Love and the Ruins. Um, it's published in 1971. Um, it's his third novel. It's the story of a self-professed bad Catholic, Dr. Thomas More who suffers a catastrophe of the self, but is rescued in the end by God's unmerited grace. While the two novels are very much the same in substance, Love in the Ruins has a very different style than The Moviegoer. The Moviegoer is a kind of earnest novel in imitation of the writings of Camus or Sartre. While The Moviegoer takes place in the ordinary south of Percy's time, Love in the Ruins takes place in a futuristic, post-apocalyptic South. It is not written in a serious or earnest or existentialist tone. It is, in fact, comical satire. Percy is careful to note, however, that his satire is not primarily destructive. It ruthlessly attacks and makes fun of, but only ultimately to affirm something that is true and good and beautiful. Satire, Percy argues, when done well, assaults the fake and phony in the name of the truth. It ridicules the inhuman in order to affirm what is truly human. Satire is launched in the mode of hope, the hope that people can come to themselves, that they can survive catastrophe, and they can eventually gain the self-knowledge that is necessary for a happy life. 
Now, one reason that a Catholic writer may want to turn to apocalyptic themes or an apocalyptic landscape is the idea that the end of the old world and the beginning of the new world is a useful tool to address the problem that I already addressed, the problem of prostituted language. Because it's only when everything has come apart and when the center has failed to hold and things have by and large stopped making sense that language might be truly renewed. That is to say, it's only in the ruins, perhaps, that words can, re can regain their value and their true meaning, and that something might finally be revealed. So Love in the Ruins explores the loss and recovery of a single self in a self-professed bad Catholic, Dr. Thomas More. The scene is a kind of future post-apocalyptic America. Things have fallen apart figuratively and literally. Politically, the United States has descended into a kind of very extreme political polarization between supposedly God-fearing conservatives and sex-obsessed liberal atheists. The novel opens as any novel attempting to diagnose the problems of these United States surely must on the 4th of July. But we find our protagonist not at a barbecue or a picnic or a firework display with his happy family. We find him crouching in a grove of pines off the interstate near an abandoned hotel in which he has squirreled away three women, piles of books, and many cases of cheap whiskey. So this is, I'll just read you um, the way that the novel begins. Now in these dread latter days of the old, violent, beloved USA, and of the Christ-forgetting, Christ-haunted, death-dealing Western world, I came to myself in a grove of young pines, and the question came to me, has it happened at last? Here I sit, in any case, against a young pine, broken out in hives and waiting for the end of the world. Safe here for the moment, though, Flanks protected by a rise of ground on the left and an approach ramp on the right, the carbine lies across my lap. So we, we don't really know what's going on, but we are reassured that these are bad times. Principalities and powers are everywhere victorious. Wickedness flourishes in high places. And Percy goes on to talk about some catastrophe that's imminent, right? Um, we're not really sure at the beginning of the novel what on earth is going on. And our protagonist, our hero, Dr. Tom Moore, admits pretty early on that he is crazy. He was in fact committed to an institution after an attempted suicide on Christmas Eve. And so we sort of get the sense that he's not really a reliable narrator. Love in the Ruins operates under a general principle that the so-called normal world is in fact so crazy that only a patient in a mental hospital could possibly recover a degree of perspective and stability. Although Tom Moore is a physician, he is a not very successful psychiatrist, he himself freely admits that he is deeply unwell. He is subject to attacks of elation and depression as well as occasional seizures and something called morning terrors. In the novel, the Catholic Church has suffered a schism. It has splintered into three groups. There is the American Catholic Church, whose new Rome is in Cicero, Illinois. <laughs> this church has retained the traditional Latin mass, but also plays the Star Spangled Banner at the elevation and has a particular theological focus on property rights. There are also the Dutch schismatics. These are Catholics who believe in relevance, but not in God, and whose clergy have all gotten married, divorced, and then remarried. <laughs> and finally, there is what Percy calls the Roman Catholic remnant, a tiny scattered flock with no place to go. This remnant of a remnant, remnant of a remnant, is scattered and demoralized. They have one lone priest, Father Smith, who has taken a second job of necessity as a fire watcher. But in addition to forest fires, he assures us he also keeps an eye out for signs and portents. It is to the remnant that Dr. Tom Moore belongs, although 
He hasn't attended Mass or partaken of the sacraments since his daughter died and his wife ran off with another man, which was the occasion of a kind of severe alcoholism for him and also probably his attempted suicide. So our narrator speaks of an imminent catastrophe whose causes and effects and prevention are known only to him. Now, Dr. Moore believes, quite literally for most of this novel, that he and he alone can save mankind from this looming catastrophe, the nature of which is never really quite clear. How will he do this? How will he save the world? Through a scientific breakthrough, Dr. Moore has invented the qualitative quantitative ontological lapsometer, a so-called stethoscope of the spirit that measures a person's innermost self. Dr. Moore earnestly believes that with a reading of his lapsometer, which he can give to anyone, he can diagnose the various pathologies of the self that people find themselves experiencing. He considers this invention one of the three greatest scientific breakthroughs of modernity. But he also, con he also confesses to the reader without a hint of irony, that he is completely nuts, mad as a hatter in his own words. And it seems he is. But the irony, and this is, I think, a special kind of brilliance on Percy's part, the irony is that it's his madness that will be his saving grace. And the truth is that Dr. Moore is perceptive. He knows that he and everyone else is genuinely sick. He sees what has been lost and stands in need of recovery is a proper understanding of the human person as an integrated whole. Dr. Moore's lapsometer works as a device in the novel to clue us into the fact that the root of the catastrophe we face is a loss of a kind of original spiritual integrity that we have all suffered an original catastrophe of the self and are now in need of some kind of cure or medicine. This catastrophe is also what explains why Dr. Moore is a bad Catholic. So this is how he describes his faith. I am a Roman Catholic, albeit a bad one. I believe in the Holy Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman Church, in God the Father, in the election of the Jews, in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who founded the church on Peter, his first vicar, which will last until the end of the world. Some years ago, however, I stopped eating Christ and communion, I stopped going to Mass, and have fallen into a disorderly life. I believe in God and the whole business, but frankly, I love women the best, music and science next, whiskey next, God forth, and my fellow man hardly at all. Generally, I do as I please. A man, wrote John, who says he believes in God and does not keep his commandments is a liar. If John is right, then I am a liar. Nevertheless, I still believe. So this is the, the nature of his bad Catholicism. Now, how is it possible to believe and nevertheless not live what you believe? How is it that we can do this? I think the sense that we get from the novel is that Dr. Moore's predicament is just one particular manifestation of a deeper problem we all face, a lack of proper integration or wholeness in the parts of ourselves and an inability to be perfectly wedded to the true good, right? You can think of St. Augustine and, and the divided will or the divided self. I think Percy is kind of trying to get on to the, to the same problem. Now, part of the problem, as Percy sees it, is that the human person is somehow simultaneously part angel and part beast. He is both spiritual and rational, but also material and embodied. And this condition pulls the human person in opposite directions. And as we tend naturally to extremes, we can see people swinging back and forth between these two kind of extremes of false self-consciousness. And this is what Percy calls angelism on the one hand and bestialism on the other. So those who are prone to angelism deny or radically downplay our embodiment. These characters in the novel are abstracted and alienated from themselves 
and they tend to try to transcend themselves through art and science. One character is so abstracted that she only refers to herself in the third person. And Percy thinks that the scientist stands in a posture of abstraction, right? A kind of um, objectivity against the world where the scientist sees everything as an object, kind of takes an alienated uh, stance on things. Um, and that, that too is a kind of angelism. And Tom Moore's first wife, the one who leaves him, is a kind of Gnostic spiritualist. And she too represents the dangers of the false tra self transcendence of angelism. And she is particularly freaked out by his Catholicism, right? And what she really doesn't like about his Catholicism is, is all of the um, material objects that Catholics use, not just in the sacraments, but um, in, in various forms of Catholic piety. She doesn't, at one point in the novel, she says, objects have no place in religion. Right, it should all sort of be in the realm of pure thought. So the opposite of angelism is bestialism. The bestial self is immersed in the comforts and conveniences associated with our material embodied form of life. While one self has completely transcended reality, the other is completely immersed in consumption and bodily pleasure. These characters tend to be obsessed with the gratifications of sex. But neither the angel nor the beast is an intact or properly integrated human self, because the human is a rational animal, somehow both angel and beast. His creaturely comforts must be oriented to something higher, it is true, but this orientation is not a leaving behind of the embodied self. Sex is merely bestial, for instance, when not ordered to the higher goods of marriage and ultimately ordered to God through the sacrament. But some of the funniest moments in the novel take place in what is called the love clinic, uh, which is kind of this, it's kind of this scientific institute dedicated to studying our sex drive on a purely material level. Um, so you, you can imagine how that plays out in the novel. Um, but this, of course, is, is simultaneously both bestialism and angelism uh, in, in various ways, depending on whether you're the scientific observer or the, the actual, uh, well, I hesitate to say couple, but um, the, the people um, that are, uh, I, don't, I don't know, they're, they're having sex in the love clinic so as to be observed by the scientists. And this is really Percy at his funniest when he is ruthlessly making fun of those who think that this is uh, in any way serious. I don't want to spoil the novel for anyone here. You should definitely read it. But suffice it to say that Dr. Moore's lapsometer will not and definitely does not save humanity. The mistake all along, it turns out, was to think that we can save ourselves. We cannot. And this is precisely where the novel ends, not with Dr. Moore winning the Nobel Prize and saving the human race, or even saving these beleaguered United States. The novel ends in Dr. Moore finally coming to himself, confessing his sins, showing genuine contrition, and donning a hair shirt for penance. And then he eats Christ, drinks his blood, and goes home to be with his new family. The novel ends then on, again, a hopeful note that Dr. Moore just might have a chance of being an intact self, but this is only possible when the material and the spiritual unite in the sacraments, when we realize that we need the medicine of grace to be whole again and to be fully integrated selves. And for Percy, there is no chance of meaningful happiness in this life without self-knowledge. There is no chance of self-knowledge without knowledge of one's own sins. And in the climactic moment um, that I won't spoil for you, but I will just say in a general way, what happens is that Dr. Moore finally does see his own sins as sins and understands the full depth of what that means. And once Dr. Moore finally sees that he is a sinner in need of God's grace and that the sacraments are the medicine that he needs in order to be healed, he is able to live in the everyday world again. This is the true discovery 
that Dr. Thomas More makes at the end of Love and the Ruins. It is not a scientific discovery. He will not get a Nobel Prize for it. It will yield him nothing in the realm of worldly ambition. But in the end, we find Tom Moore in the same condition in which we find Binks Bowlings, with the hope of being able to live, but not as a member of the society of the spiritually dead, but as a real human being. And this somehow makes him distinctive. So I want to end by summing up why I think Catholics, especially American Catholics, would do well to be reading Percy's Love in the Ruins in our times. I think that what Percy's novel shows us in a rather brilliant and incredibly fantastical and funny way is that we are not, in fact, autonomous selves who will create our own destinies. We will not achieve happiness with simple created goods that satisfy our basic appetites. In fact, we long for so much more than simply feeling good. We will never, in fact, be happy just living in the moment and enjoying good things like sex and flowers and good weather, although these are good things and very enjoyable. We will also not be happy living in a completely abstracted and alien way. These are two extreme forms of a kind of false human self-consciousness. And finally, I think what Percy is keen to show in this novel is that science will not and cannot save us just by giving us the proper techniques that we need to be happy. Because it cannot even properly diagnose what is wrong with us in the first place. And if we want to be happy, Percy counsels, then we must first understand ourselves. We must have knowledge of our own sins, including knowledge of our original catastrophe, and ask for the help that we really need, which is found in the sacramental life of the church, the place where the spiritual and the material, the infinite and the finite, and the sacred and the profane inevitably meet. Thank you for your attention. Do you think people experience and benefit from Catholicism depending on which phase of their life they are in and what their how that's driving their personal needs? Jen, well, can you repeat the yeah. oh Sorry, yeah, the okay. Uh, so he's asking about um, a, a, a psychologist, um, someone who was, I think, one of the founders of personality psychology, Maslow, and this idea of there being a kind of hierarchy of needs. Um, so it's, it's a kind of developmental picture of the human person. And Maslow's idea is that if you want to reach the higher goods, you have to have secured the, the lower goods, right? And you kind of move your way up. And then um, at one point in his career, Maslow became dissatisfied um, with, the, with the kind of basic hierarchy that he created, and he stuck self-transcendence on the top. Um, I think... Um, I think at some level, what Maslow is on about is kind of common sense, right? I mean, we develop in stages. Um, you know, there's so much good empirical work um, that demonstrates that things need to be secured on like um, a perceptual level before you can, example, learn a language. Um, and so one of the reasons why um, people with autism can struggle to develop language properly is because they have this um, sensory integration disorder, right? Um, and there are all these interesting studies that show things like, you know, if you, if you have trouble locomoting early on, um, then you will have trouble reading, and you will have trouble speaking, and things like this. So I think on some level, like, there's, there's something obviously true about what Maslow is saying, but I also think that Maslow um, is kind of missing 
uh, missing some things in his theory. For example, if you look at what he says about self-transcendence, um, it could equally be satisfied by going to a Nazi rally. Like, there's no reason why self-transcendence, in his sense, couldn't be a kind of deeply questionable thing to feel, precisely because it can't disambiguate between what we might call true self-transcendence and false self-transcendence. Um, and so I think there's a lot that's valuable about his theory, but I, I would also say that it's limited. Is that kind of... But, you know, my real question was, do you think people experience Catholicism and benefit from it differently as they move through different phases of their lives? And is there a way to somehow relate your personal happiness and your beliefs of the church so that you maximize those benefits over time? Well, I mean, I think surely um, as people develop, they come to have a greater sense of self and hopefully a deeper faith, right? So, um, you know, a small child can memorize his catechism, but his ability to really understand what that means and also to live, right, the faith in a meaningful way is, is limited by the way that young children are limited and their ability to deliberate and think and act and see the whole. Um, so I do think that people experience their faith differently over time in developmental stages. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I think what you ultimately hope for is a condition of mature faith in which you not only believe, but also reflect on what you believe, um, are able to communicate what you believe to others, and most importantly, to really act and be committed to what you believe. And that would be something that could only possibly be borne out through experience, living a long life, undergoing a lot of trials, right? Um, having to, as it were, persevere. Um, and young children, for a variety of reasons, um, aren't, aren't able to do that yet. Jen, first of all, really impressive presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're a table of people who have an interest in history. Yes. I was wondering if you could talk about the time frame that Percy is writing, uh, kind of like that historical time during World War II, slightly after, and how that affected his writing and, and um, thoughts about life. Yeah, so Percy, when he is sick, Oh, sorry, she just wants to know, um, I take it you want to know about sort of like the cultural and intellectual milieu in which he's developing as a writer. Yeah. Yes. So when he um, contracts tuberculosis and goes into the sanitarium, it's like 1943, uh, you know, so we're in the middle of World War II, <laughs> for example. Um, and, uh, you know, what... What he's doing at that time is he's really uh, coming into contact with the continental philosophers, um, both the atheist existentialists and the Christian existentialists. So he's reading Camus and Sartre and Heidegger, um, but he's also reading Kierkegaard and Marcel. Um, and I think that he is very, he's obviously very taken with Kierkegaard. So when I teach the moviegoer to my students, I always have them read Kierkegaard's A Sickness Unto Death because I think those two are mutually illuminating texts. Um, Kierkegaard's idea of despair, I think is very much uh, what Walker Percy is trying to communicate uh, with Binks and his feeling of the malaise. Um, and so he's, you know, he's, he's situated in this intellectual climate, um, he's not, but then he also is really into purse. Um, so, so he's, he's, yeah, he's really into the pragmatists. 
So, so he's not just reading continental philosophers. He's re I, I think this is somehow like. Uh, um, but he's also reading the American pragmatists. And um, it's from Peirce that he actually is getting some of his major commitments about language. Um, so he thinks that language is necessarily this intersubjective um, phenomenon. And this really cuts against, for example, Sartre. Um, Sartre has this view of the human person that's a kind of radical individual. Um, he's a kind of self-creating, radical individual, um, almost sort of locked into a kind of solipsism. And, and, I, and I think his reading of Peirce is, is really tempering that um, and really showing the, the ext I don't know, <laughs> maybe I should just, I'll just speak loudly. I think everybody can hear me, right? Yeah, no. so, um, no, okay, I don't know what to do because this isn't working, so. Well, I'll, I'll just roll with it. Anyway, um, yeah, so he's reading the American pragmatists, and he's also reading the continental existentialists. Um, and of course, he's also really steeped in, um, in literature. He's very influenced by Dostoevsky. Uh, he's very much in contact with Flannery O'Connor. Uh, he's very influenced by Faulkner. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, does that kind of give you a sense of, OK, yeah. Sure. We have an online question that I'll read. Okay. Um, and then we'll have another okay. in Great. person. So this is from the online participant, uh, Fark Manson. As a philosopher, do you agree that it is the novelist, as Percy says, who properly philosophizes in our contemporary postmodern culture? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> what a great question. Um, well, I mean, I hope not. <laughs> I don't want to give up my job, and I'm not a novelist. Um, so, I, so, I mean, your question is really getting at the intersection of philosophy and literature, which is something that I am completely obsessed with and have devoted a podcast to exploring. But um, I think from, I, th I think Percy is such an interesting person to me because like Iris Murdoch, for example, he is both a philosopher and a novelist. And um, people who manage to do both um, tend to have really interesting things to say about the relationship between philosophy and literature. And I think for Percy, um, and, and I think this is, um, I think this is similar to Iris Murdoch. I, I think for Walker Percy, Philosophy is extremely important and worth doing. Um, and certainly, it was philosophy that was the impetus for him to become a fiction writer. But philosophy is limited in what it can show us. Um, and art, right, uh, our art for Percy is a, is a truth-revealing enterprise. But I think that it's not revealing truth in the same way that philosophy is, or that theology is, or that science is, for that matter. I mean, I've, I've kind of been beating up on the science of happiness people, but <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to be clear that Percy um, is not anti-science. Um, but he wants to keep science in its proper place. And I think in the same way, he wants to keep philosophy in its proper place and that there is a special role for art um, in, in our search for truth. And, um, you know, Percy is actually um, close to Flannery O'Connor in lots of interesting ways. Um, and one way in which he's close to Flannery O'Connor is this idea that, you know, the Catholic novelist uh, writing in our Christ-haunted post-Christian age has to work by indirection, has to think of ways to startle and unsettle his or her reader. Um, and that is something that the philosopher never has to think about, right? The philosopher is just going to make arguments. Um, but the thing, but the reason why philosophy is limited is that if you're starting from a different set of first premises, 
And if you have a different set of first principles, arguments really aren't going to be that effective. And one way to think about the job of the novelist is to try to reveal um, what some of our most problematic first premises are. Um, and that, for me, is really one of the central values of novelists uh, in, in relation to doing philosophy. Yes, hello. Do I remember correctly that Flannery O'Connor referred to herself as a hillbilly Thomas? Yes, she did. And she, read, she regularly read St. Thomas. Is there any evidence that uh, Walker Percy uh, studied St. Thomas Aquinas? Yes, so the question is, did Walker Percy study St. Thomas Aquinas? And the answer I'm so pleased to tell you is yes. <laughs> um, he is not a hillbilly by any stretch of the imagination, and he's not a Thomist. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination either. But I think that, um, I, I mean, I, I do consider myself a Thomist, um, and I see nothing at odds, uh, I see nothing at odds with the truth, really, in Percy. Um, even in his philosophical writing, I just think he has, you know, he has, he has a different way of approaching it than a Thomist would. Um, but he comes to the same sorts of conclusions, just stated in a different way and coming out of a different intellectual tradition. But he did, in fact, teach Aquinas at a local seminary there in Covington or around Covington. Um, he was very interested in Aquinas. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, to what extent do you think that what Percy presents as satire in 1971 looks like prophecy today? Oh my gosh, it's, it's stunning. Thank you for asking that question. Um, it, it, I mean, one reason to read this book is that it's, show, it's so shockingly spot on. I mean, when you think about the fact that he wrote this in 1971 and he is trying to imagine from the perspective of someone as a Catholic who like just survived the late 60s. Um, he's trying to imagine what is, uh, what is his country going to be like in 50 to 60 years. And it's, um, it's uncanny how, how close it is to where we are right now. Um, and yeah, so, so I think it's prophetic in a way. I mean, he sees where things are heading. Um, and, the, and the truth is we do live in a time of extreme political polarization um, that if you could step back from it is kind of funny. I mean, we do live in a kind of absurd moment in this country right now. And um, it's, un it's unclear where it's going. <laughs> Um, and, but, I, but I think that his diagnosis is correct. I mean, one of the reasons why we're so polarized is we cannot agree about what words mean. And so many of our political disagreements are about what words mean. Um, and, 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 and I think, yeah, it's, it's worth, <laughs> it's worth thinking about how he was able to have this vision of a future that is, that is very much our own. And I think that that's a reason to reflect very carefully about what he's trying to say to us. Um, and I think it's also a reason um, to look at some of his philosophy, right? So, so some of his stuff on language and meaning um, I, I think are quite relevant as well, not just as fiction. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about your podcast? Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, she asked about my podcast. So I, I have a podcast. It's called Sacred and Profane Love. Um, it's been going for four years now. And um, basically the conceit of the podcast is that... Um, Something like the following. Uh, part, of, part of what would help us live well 
and be happier and have more meaning in our lives is if we were reading well, right? So the idea is that great literature um, is a source of truth and wisdom uh, and helping us gain the kind of self-knowledge, right, that Percy is, is saying that we need. And so every episode of the podcast, um, I interview uh, some guest, either a philosopher or a theologian or a writer or a literary critic, um, and we talk about a great book that has some kind of meaning for that person. Um, and we try to kind of tease out the wisdom in it. And usually every episode has like either a theology and a um, novel pair or a philosophy and novel pair. So for example, um, I've done episodes on Aquinas and Flannery O'Connor. Um, I've done episodes on Kierkegaard and Walker Percy and, and stuff like this. So. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to say that my next guest is Professor Thomas Hibbs of Baylor University. Um, and we're going to be talking about Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. And then after that, I will have the Catholic novelist Christopher Beha on the podcast. And I'm really excited about that. Um, so, yeah, you, you should definitely listen to my podcast. <laughs>